Hello and welcome to Hollywood Crime Scene. I'm your host, Joe Hollywood. And once again, I am joined by Imaginos Pete. Hello. And Andrew, I was trying to come up with a nickname uh, for you. Andrew. Uh, I, I have to. <laughs> the big red one. No. Walker. I don't know. Andrew, private joker. <laughs> one of my favorite characters. Saving private Andrew. One of my favorite characters <laughs> from one of my favorite war movies from Full Metal Jacket. Private right. Joker. All right. Matthew Modine. So, uh, Again, we're going to deviate a little bit from our normal theme of uh, unsolved Hollywood crimes, and we're going to pay tribute uh, to those uh, Hollywood actors who have served their country. We are recording this podcast just a few days after Memorial Day, so we wanted to honor our uh, Hollywood veterans, those who have fallen, those who have served, and talk about Hollywood's role in uh, helping win the war. And so that's going to be our topic today, is Hollywood at War. Yes. That classic mid-Atlantic accent there. (laughs) (laughs) This goes out to, I'm trying to remember, was it, who was it who who had that catchphrase on the radio and they would end with, and all the ships at sea. You remember that? Yeah. We'll we'll have to look that up. One of those old newsreels would be like. Yeah. And now the boys at Hollywood crime scene (laughs) will discuss Memorial Day. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So I wanted to start off now. I want, I want to sort of preface by saying that while people are out there barbecuing and, and swimming in the pool over Memorial Day weekend, they may say things like, uh, oh, we're honoring our veterans. And technically, uh, over Memorial Day weekend and on Memorial Day, you're not necessarily honoring veterans, even though there's nothing wrong with that. Right. But veterans have their day in November, Veterans Day, where you can thank veterans for their service. Um, what Memorial Day is all about is remembering those lives lost uh, at war, at sea, uh, in all the wars. The ceremony that they have here in Lake Warren, Michigan, go as far back as honoring the Civil War dead uh, and all the wars since then, um, World War II, Korean War, uh, Afghanistan, all that stuff. And, and uh, we've lost quite a few uh uh, homebodies here from Lake Orion uh, in conflict. So really that's what Memorial Day is all about, is remembering the lives lost. So I wanted to start out by bringing up a couple of names of, of Hollywood stars, Hollywood celebrities who paid the ultimate price. Uh, specifically, I'm going to talk about World War II. Uh, some of them were uh, came across as a little bit of a surprise. I would see a name and go, I, I know that name. And then I'd read it and go, oh, oh my gosh, I had no idea. And I guess that's what this podcast is about, to encourage people to yes. dig and go down those rabbit holes, yeah, as we yes. like to call it. and Discover. And, yeah, 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 and learn it, for it, yourself. Do yes. the research. Yes. Yeah, so this name may not be familiar to a lot of people. Bobby Hutchins. Does that ring a bell to anybody? No, not me. You may know him by his nickname of Weezer. Uh, he, Great band. Uh, what's that? Yeah. Great, <laughs> great band. <laughs> Did they sing Buddy Holly? Uh, yes. They yeah. <laughs> Ooh, wee. Uh, Bobby Weezer Hutchins, born March 29th, 1925, died May 17th, 1945. From 1927 to 1933, Bobby Hutchins, known as Weezer, starred in the Hal Roach Our Gang short films. Weezer, I think, was dur- during that early part of the R Gang films. Little cute kid. All right. Kind of looked like Charlie Brown a little bit. Oh, uh, oh good grief. So when he, <laughs> when he aged out of the R Gang shorts, uh, he and his family moved back to Tacoma, Washington, where he went to school. In 1943, he enlisted in the U.S. Army Air Force and enrolled in the aviation cadet program with hopes of being a pilot. Only a week before graduation, Hutchins was killed in a mid-air collision on May 17, 1945 Mm. at Merced Army Airfield in California. Uh, He was trying to land a North American AT-6D ND Texan, whatever that is, at the 3026th base unit. Uh, The plane struck another vehicle. Uh, The other pilot, Edward Hamill, survived. and Hutchins' mother had planned to travel to the airport, 
airfield the following week to see her son graduate. He was only 20 years old. Now, that may change how you view the R gang shorts. You know, we've, we've brought up the little rascals on yes. this podcast yeah. before. Yeah, Robert Blake. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And yeah. Alfalfa, who yeah. met a tragic end. And uh, 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 when, you, <laughs> when you start learning about the fate, uh, uh, the sad fate of a lot of these little rascals and our gang actors, man, it's, it's you go back and you watch those shorts and they take on a new meaning. Like, they were so young, so innocent and funny. And some of them just met tragic ends. Uh, and we've talked about a lot of them. But... Uh, Weezer, we lost Weezer serving his country, not in in battle, but in uh, in training. Training, and, yeah. and that happens. We we lost a Lake Orion uh, resident, Trevor Blaylock, in a helicopter training uh, uh, accident, and that's treated no differently than losing but, your life. Yeah. In battle, was that so. was that fairly recent? Yeah, yeah, that was just a few years ago, maybe five or six years ago. Yeah, I, yeah. I missed that. Yeah, they went that's... all out in honoring him. I mean, so my personal opinion is, it feels a, a little extra tragic. When it's a training accident, yeah, it, yeah. yes, it seems unnecessary. Yeah, like it, it could have been every prevented. Every precaution should be taken for that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, I'm ninety percent sure this is correct, but uh, uh, Selfridge Air Base over in mm-hmm. Mount Clemens, uh, I believe that was named after. I believe he was the first person to die in a military plane act, like accident like he like he huh. was he was a first and this this was early oh. like 1916 uh but they named the base after him wow i don't I know, know that i, I didn't know that the, i don't remember his first name or the exact circumstances but it was named after uh one of the first guys who died uh in a army uh air force uh accident and this is why we have a deep bench on hollywood crime scene that's right <laughs> we all bring something to the we table we do so there's some other names on this list. I'm kind of skipping through. I don't recognize a lot of names. Um, but one I definitely wanted to bring up, uh, she did not serve her country in the way you might think. But Carol Lombard was a patriot, uh, born October 6, 1908, died January 16, 1942. This is such a tragic story. And I don't know if we've ever touched on this um, on our podcast unless – I don't remember if we brought it up on our Blonde Bombshells episode. We might have. But... I mean, we're a morbid bunch, but so we might have covered, <laughs> we've covered a lot of tragedies. There's a lot of recurring show. themes yeah. on this uh, show. Uh, so Carol Lombard uh, was a civilian. Uh, she is considered the first American woman killed uh, in World War II or during World War II, which is pretty shocking to think about it. Uh, when the United States entered the war, uh, Lombard became passionate about selling war bonds. She sold uh, war bonds at a rally in her home state of Indiana, where she sold, now think about this, this is 1942 dollars. She sold more than $2 million worth of war bonds wow. uh, during her, her tour. Wow. Um, most of her trip to and through Indiana uh, had been by train, but she was getting uh, a little tired of, of the, uh, you know, the discomfort of riding by train sure and she wanted to get back to her home in los angeles so she decided to fly uh, while returning home to los angeles by way of las vegas lombard her mother elizabeth peters and the rest of the crew were killed in a plane crash on january 16 1942 uh-huh. uh, the plane crashed into a cliff off potosi mountain uh, she was only 33 at the time she was married to clark gable who was just despondent over her death he sure. and um, he was serving he was well in reaction to her death he then enlisted in the u.s army oh, air force uh, wow. to fight in world war ii uh to defend her honor but, yeah that 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 was his uh attempt at uh trying to make sense of it and yeah and uh yeah <laughs> yes and so in her honor in 1944 a military cargo ship was named the ss carol lombard in her honor um if you've never seen her on screen, she's amazing. One of the most beautiful actresses I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. Um, what's kind of sad is growing up and being sort of a, early in my life, being sort of a passing fan of classic movies, I didn't know her name. I didn't know who she was. And I remember being in Hollywood in 2005, I think it was, 
I went to a uh, bookstore. I think it was the Larry Edmonds bookstore in, on Hollywood Boulevard there. And they had uh, eight by 10 headshots of uh, classic movie stars. And I'm flipping through these headshots and there were these eyes on this blonde woman that made my jaw drop. And I picked up that eight by 10 and stared at it. And it was like, love at first sight. It's one of the most beautiful women I've ever seen. I since learned that her name was Carol Lombard and I started watching some of her movies. I was like, where have you been my whole life? She was a great actress, a beautiful woman, a true patriot who lost her life uh, raising money uh, for the war effort. So a uh, little tribute to Carol Lombard there. Um, another, what was that? You're going to add something? Yeah. No. Nope. Uh, another, uh, this is one of the more famous names that we lost during World War II. And this is sort of an odd story. Uh, Glenn Miller. Uh, born March 1st, 1904, died December 15th, 1944. He was a band leader and trombone player, uh, led one of the most popular dance bands in the 40s. Yeah. Uh, he was too old to be drafted, so he decided to volunteer to lead the Army military band during World War II. Uh, Miller wanted to modernize traditional military marches and blend jazz songs with marches and... Uh, Apparently, I guess he wrote St. Louis Blues March. Uh, he was quoted as saying, America means freedom, and there's no expression of freedom quite so sincere as music, he was uh, quoted as saying. Uh, Miller became a major and led the Army Air Force Band. He and his band traveled across England and performed for troops, giving 800 performances. Miller and his band stayed in England, uh, but on December 15, 1944, Miller was set to fly across the English Channel to Paris, France, to perform in a congratulatory performance for American troops that had recently helped to liberate Paris. En route uh, in a single-engine aircraft, uh, Miller and two other passengers, Lieutenant uh, Colonel Norman Bassell and pilot John Morgan, disappeared, just disappeared over the English Channel. Wow. Uh, over the years, there have been much speculation over what happened, including the possibility of uh, friendly fire, um, allied planes were known to have dropped unused bombs in the English Channel. There might have been some sort of an accident there. Hmm. Uh, a 2014 Chicago Tribune article says a defective carburetor in the plane may have caused the crash. Um, I had read conflicting reports about whether or not they found the wreckage at the bottom of the English Channel. Hmm. I think it was discovered fairly early on, but then left there, and I don't know if it was ever uh, they returned to it. Well, let's get uh, James Cameron after it. Yeah, right. <laughs> let's go find uh, Glenn Miller's plane. Yeah, uh, he was forty old, forty years old when he passed away. So, you know, it's kind of sad. A lot of, a lot of celebrities, when World War II broke out, they would go over there and not necessarily fight in combat, but they would star in films and entertain the troops and that sort of thing. And so it's sad to think that someone who went over there just to not fight, but entertain the troops right. would lose their life overseas and that's that's his pretty legacy tragic. lives on in case anyone ever wants to know and joan i have a youtube clip here for a very iconic sound is a song that glenn miller's played that people might be aware of if i could see can you hold it up to your mic yep a little closer put it right close there we go that just sets the tone doesn't it in the mood okay What's what's the, awesome. what's the title of that? In the Mood. In the Mood, in the mood. In the mood in by the Glenn mood. Miller. So I, that, yeah. that I, has lived I, on in Hollywood. I'm pretty sure that there's a, ver, a modern uh, modern version of that song in that movie Swingers. Have you guys seen that with? Oh, oh John, it's been a long time. John, yeah. Fa John Favreau. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, yeah, Glenn Miller I in the Mood tra has lived on in almost every decade going on. That with people reference it, they'll make it. It's almost like you hear it. If people want to make, oh, you're an an okay boomer joke they'll play that song like you you speak of that old timey stuff hey well i love that stuff yeah and yeah I, yeah sometimes i just i'm in the mood for that stuff and yeah. uh, i'll be playing it in my cars i'm driving along i love that stuff. heck yeah i'm kind of curious to a speakeasy if you can quickly access imdb i think there's a movie the glenn miller story and i, I want to say jimmy stewart starred in it but you might have to look that up but if you can get me that answer um that's one I think I need to add to my watching queue. If uh, I seem to recall a movie called The Glenn Miller Story, let me know if you Let's find see. it. 
Um, in the meantime, I'm going to talk about one one more actor. Uh, again, one of the more famous actors who lost their lives uh, lost their life during World War II. Leslie Howard, April third, nineteen eighteen ninety three is when he was born. Died June first, nineteen forty three. He was a British actor, had a long film career that began in 1917 up until his death. Uh, today, most people know him for the role of Ashley Wilkes in Gone with the Wind. Um, by the time filming for Gone with the Wind was complete, the war had begun in Europe. Uh, Howard felt it was only right to leave Hollywood and return home to Great Britain to fight for his country, even though that meant forfeiting work in Hollywood. So he gave up his career to go defend uh, England. The British government asked Howard to make broadcasts to the uh, then neutral United States, hoping to change their mind and join the war effort. Uh, Howard also filmed and starred in several British patriotic films. In 1943, Howard, who was a civ uh, civilian, boarded a flight to England from Portugal, where he was acting as the British cultural ambassador. According to a 2015 article in The Telegraph, Howard's civilian flight Flight 777 of the KLM uh, Royal Dutch Airlines was shot down by the Luftwaffe uh, mm. over the Bay of Biscay, killing all 17 passengers on board. Uh, until June 1st, 1943, the Luftwaffe had, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Is that right, Luftwaffe? The Luftwaffe, yeah. Uh, yeah. Have yeah. never, ever attacked a civilian flight. Mm. There is uh, much speculation as to why this particular civilian flight was shot down. Though it has never been confirmed, some had speculated that the Germans thought Winston Churchill was on board. Wow. Uh, which Churchill himself believed as the reason for the flight being shot down. He was 50 years old when uh, the plane was shot down. Wow. So, so well, again, next time you watch Gone with the Wind, uh, take your hat off for Leslie Howard, who gave up a Hollywood career to fight for England and was shot down during World War II. Well, over here on Glenn Miller, Joe, uh, yes. is an actor. He's been in three movies, The Big Broadcast of 1936, Sun Valley Serenade, 1941, and Orchestra Wives in 1942. But is that's there, was, was, IMDb. was there a, a, a biopic? Like, yeah, that's like what I was saying? wondering. Glenn, you, you said, Glenn was, Miller's story. Was it Jimmy Stewart, you said? I thought so. Yeah, there is. So the Glenn Miller story came out in 1954. Oh, there we go. Yep. It's okay. a biography of Glenn Miller from his beginnings to his death over the English Channel in 1944. Wow. Yeah. And Harry Morgan it does James star Stewart. Jimmy Stewart, June Allison, Harry Morgan, who have mash fame. Um, Louis so Armstrong. Yeah, wow. I may. Uh, Louis I'm, Armstrong is in it. Yeah. I didn't know he he acted. He, I think he was in a couple of things. He, yeah. he played himself. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, uh, cool. Yeah, so I'm gonna have to uh, get that film. I don't know if I've ever seen the Glenn Miller story. Yeah, see so if it's streaming it somewhere. Yeah, but so. I, like I said, when I when now now I, you talk about taking up tipping your hat and taking it off for Glenn Miller. Ah, oh, jeez. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now those are some of the uh, stars of the time who lost their lives during World War II. But there were many many stars who served their country during World War II, and some of these names might surprise you. Again, as I was doing research, I'm like, what? Really? Uh, Yul Brynner. Yeah. Yul Brynner, who was in The King and I, Magnificent Seven, uh, The uh, Westworld. Ten Commandments. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. The Russian-born Yul Brynner fought on the side of the Allies as an announcer for the U.S. Office of War Information, delivering messages to an uh, occupied France at the time. Uh, okay. Sydney. Potier, yeah, uh, he served briefly. Um, he would, this is their wording, not mine. Uh, he would assist white medical staff for shell shocked soldiers. Say that three times real quick. <laughs> Returning home from battle, uh, not savoring his time. He wrote this in his 1980 memoir, This Life. Uh, we would tend wards and administered coal pack shock treatments and other supposedly rehabilitative therapies we would in time become no more than jailers uh the army was not heavily into the mental health business so right. does not reflect fondly but he did serve his uh, country now here's one again man sometimes as we're doing research i i read these stories and i'm like how did i never hear of this 
Um, like I said, a, a lot of times celebrities will go fight overseas, not fight overseas, but serve overseas sure. as announcers, entertainment. Rod Sterling, uh, creator and host of the Twilight, Twilight Zone. Zone. Yeah, my uh, man. He that... saw some stuff yes, overseas. Sir. And there's one story that just, just blew my mind. And it, it, you're going to find out that that was a really bad pun that was unintentional. <laughs> but um, So... Rod Serling served in World War II uh, before he became uh, famous in the 50s. Uh, He served as a paratrooper. Serling was said to be feisty and became quite the boxer in the camp. Um, The National World War II Museum writes, in one instance, Serling's good friend, Private Melvin Levi, or Levy, ventured out to watch an aircraft drop off food crates to beleaguered paratroopers. Now, I read several different versions of this story. S- some versions said that this guy, this private uh, Levy, was sort of a comedian. He would entertain his, his fellow troops and make them laugh. So apparently, while, while his fellow troops were kind of sitting around laughing, he was on his feet joking about where the food would fall when one of the crates landed on his head and decapitated him as Serling <laughs> oh, looked on in horror. That's a Twilight Zone episode right there, oh, man. My, that's... So imagine the stuff that Rod Serling witnessed fighting World War II that he would then later use uh, as anti-war messages and things like that in the Twilight Zone series. But, yeah. Yeah, Serling saw some action. Wow. It's pretty wild. Yeah, and just to add on um, to that, uh, I, I, there was a time where I did binge, and I went through every single Twilight Zone episode. Oh, wow. Over the course of, I mean, I didn't watch 20 episodes a day, but yeah. over the course of you know months, and you see recurring themes. Yeah. Anti-war. End of the world. End of the world. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sometimes anti-fascist. Um, I don't want to say anti-authority, but questioning, undue, yeah, challenging uh, authority, challenging, uh, authority. challenging norms. Um, yeah, yeah. And and uh, as far as I know, Rod Sterling had a lot to do uh, creatively with probably almost every episode. Uh, oh sure, he sure. was a, he was a workhorse. Yeah, he he never stopped. And he was a genius. Yeah, genius. and. Um, just like I, I, I just had even more respect for that guy, and uh, I, like, man, where's our Rod Serling today? You know, like who's out there putting out these? I think these heavy... Jordan Peele is trying to be a modern day Rod Serling. I think uh, with yeah. his film trilogy that he's released, some are right. better than others, but yeah. I think there's some people trying to claim that title of it's going to take a village to replace someone like Rod Serling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was uh, pretty. Like I said, the guy was a genius. And what I'm also hearing, Andrew, is that you have the capacity to binge Twilight Zone, but yet you <laughs> you're batting like 187 when it comes to our like movie, fil- fil- our <laughs> recommendations, fil- fil- yeah. films in general. <laughs> yeah, we have a long list bat- of movies for you to watch, and you're like, I want to watch Twilight Zone again. Even if you were at 33, percent you'd be in Cooperstown. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, another famous name, uh, following Pearl Harbor, three-time Oscar-nominated Kirk Douglas enlisted in 1941. That blows my mind. It's one thing to be drafted. It's another thing to be in, to enlist, um, yeah. when you have a Hollywood career going. Yeah. Uh, failing the dexterity test for the Army, Douglas would join the Navy instead. Reflecting in 1990, Douglas said to Playbill magazine, I... Felt a wave of patriotism and a wave of Jewishness about what was happening in Europe with Hitler. Uh, His role was with the anti-submarine unit, dropping depth charges on Japanese subs. So this guy saw action. He was out. Right. Uh, Past time, that would be the very reason he would uh, be medically discharged when he was almost killed through a shipmate's mistake. Now, I tried to find details of that incident, and I couldn't find it. I'm going to have to try to figure out what had happened there. Yeah, that it's, bur- like it's a- buried somewhere in the Pentagon when you almost kill Spartacus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, we don't Someone else will out. step up. I am Spartacus. Uh, here's another surprising one. Mel Brooks. Mm. Mel Brooks, resident funny man, it says here, actor and director Mel Brooks, 
has made some of the best comedies of all time, but uh, how on earth could he translate that to a world at war? From a radio operator to combat engineer, the Army seemed to throw Brooks into any random position they believed he fit, <laughs> which is hilarious. That is irresponsible. I can't concentrate and have Mel Brooks as my radio operator. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to die. Just make up. Make up a sound. <laughs> as combat engineer, Mel Brooks' role was to seek out enemy mines, booby traps, and to construct bridges. Uh, frequenting France, Belgium, and even being included in the Battle of the Bulge. Brooks would be honorably discharged as corporal. Uh, still clearly a joker at 18. Uh, he had this account of his time at war. He says, uh, there were these white ceramic insulation things up on the telephone poles, and any man who shot one down won a dollar from each of the others. I was pretty good at that. I made about $21 when we got a call on our Command radio, our, our command car radio, get back to the base immediately. When we arrived to our base there, uh, there was a lot going on. Platoons of men were moving rapidly all over the place. My company commander told us uh, that Army communications had been severed. It seems that some telephone and telegraph lines had been destroyed, and it was from their target practice, which is hysterical. <laughs> um, and I, you know, reading this, I can't help but think about the interview that Jiminy Glick had with uh, Mel Brooks. You guys, a G Jiminy Glick fan, the celebrity interviewer. I, I, I know it. I know what it is, but I've, I never actually watched any, any one, episodes. One of the funniest moments is when Jiminy Glick, uh, who was played by Martin Short, says to Mel Brooks, "What's your beef with the Nazis?" <laughs> and uh, Mel Brooks clearly was not expecting that question and busted out what's my beef it was hilarious you got to check that out on uh it's online. getting added added to the list <laughs> uh christopher lee uh war efforts have become a thing of legend as yeah. time passes that's a scary one because that one is peter jackson referenced that because in lord of the rings when uh saruman gets killed and it was instead of getting when he gets spoiler stabbed, alert, yeah, when he gets <laughs> when he gets when he gets stabbed in the back and people are like ah he'd scream and Chris really goes, Peter, no man would scream like that. When you get stabbed, <gasps> it's more of a gasp because the air goes out of him. And they're like, Christopher, how do you know that? <laughs> well, now we know because he he served. Was served. What, what wasn't he in the uh, intelligence? Uh, I don't remember if he actually fought, but I I think he was well, either intelligence or uh, propaganda. He knew some things. Yeah. It says, uh, capable of speaking multiple languages, he joined the Royal Air Force in 1940, where he decoded German messages. Okay, yeah. Uh, okay. Then he joined the SAS and eventually went on to hunt Nazis. Yeah. This is like Inglorious Bastards, man. Oh, yeah, I wonder he, if that. Yeah. I wonder if that led to Tarantino. Uh, it might have been. That's awesome. But I still love that story when Peter Jackson tells it in one of those appendices. He goes. Pete, why does Christopher know these things? <laughs> now, here's an ironic statement. He said in an interview, and knowing his career in horror movies, when the Second World War finished, I was 23, and ha and, and already I had seen enough horror to last me a lifetime. Mm -hmm. And he went on to star in <laughs> yeah. hundreds of horror films. Uh, let's see. Like, like Alec Guinness? Institution. Oh, Alec Guinness. Not only did Alec Guinness star in arguably one of, one of the greatest war movies ever made but uh, bridge over a river Kwai. Yeah, yeah yeah what a great great need to uh, watch that sometime i mean <laughs> sure <laughs> i mean now you're just beating us to the punch on this, this is just... you know i always think about how alec guinness you know toward the end of his career when he's playing obi-wan kenobi in star wars how he sort of lamented the fact that that was going to be his legacy playing in this yeah. sci-fi kitty movie, as yeah. he described it, and not necessarily for Bridge Over the River Kwai. Which, you know, an Oscar. Um, he, he he did win an Oscar for that? Yeah, uh, I think he won an Oscar for that one, because uh, he definitely got nominated. I'm almost certain he got he won one. Hey, a nomination, in, in my opinion, is, I mean, almost as good as... Oh, a, yeah, hands down. For me, oh, so it's I, like a I, Final Four I, appearance. I, I, I've heard... Uh, that it it's a must see movie, so I I got to add it to my it's, it's must see his ever growing his list. character is infuriating because he plays a British soldier to a fault. Yeah, what what what, 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 if, what do you mean by that? Well, uh, I don't want to spoil it, but because yeah, but. the the British sense of morality gets in the way of, of the overall mission, and you're going what what is he doing? 
Yeah, he was. He's basically a prisoner of war, basically yeah. building a bridge for the enemy. And he wanted it to be perfect. He wanted it to be meticulous. And then he's like, "Wait a second, we're building this for the enemy." Oh, okay. I know. And then, I got you. Yeah, and the Americans are trying to sabotage it, and then he <laughs> almost prevents it. Yeah, yeah. Oh wow. Yeah, he's like, "Don't blow up my bridge." That we worked hard on it. Yeah, that makes it, the movie sound that much more interesting. Yeah, no, no, it is. It's it's a wonderful movie. Just but yeah, he yeah. and that, I think that's why he got an nominee. He he did a really great job in it. Sure. Yeah, I bet. He also, in addition to Bridge Over the River Kwai in Star Wars, uh, he was in Lawrence of Arabia. That's right. Yeah. And it says here, as lieutenant, he led a landing group of 200 men uh, in the invasion of Sicily. Wow. So, yeah. Uh, and, of course, we cannot talk about stars serving overseas during World War II without bringing up Jimmy Stewart. Yeah. Uh, while his character in It's a Wonderful Life was denied action through an ear injury. Uh, Jimmy Stewart was heavily involved joining the army in 1940. He began doing promotional films for public relations before flying for the air Corps uh, division in 1942. He went on to, to pilot B 24 liberator bombers over Nazi occupied Europe. I did not know so that. Jimmy Stewart <laughs> piloting <laughs> a bomber. Uh, over Nazi, like, that's so amazing. Pilot to bombardier. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Bom bombs away. Uh, ima Army. Imagine being on the other end of the, the <laughs> radio and. <laughs> Jim, are you doing a bit right now? I'm just yeah. focused. Well, I'm just talking. What are you talking about? It's a Luftwaffe. You got to go back over Dresden. Go back over Dresden. Bow him again. But we just dropped all of our... <laughs> that's hilarious. That's like having, again, that's like having Mel Brooks on the radio operator. Mel, you got to get off this line. Yeah, <laughs> he's doing bits. Uh, he served uh, the Air Force all the way up till 1968. Whoa. Uh, he eventually, I'm going to jump ahead here. Um, oh, it doesn't mention it in this article, but he eventually reached the rank, I want to say, of Brigadier General. And wow. I seem to recall reading that he was the highest ranked celebrity in World War II. No, no celebrity even came close to that rank. And, I, uh, yeah. So, that's uh, off, uh, brother. Well, uh, 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 Jeremy Stewart, uh, <laughs> obviously, Brigadier General. In the 60s, he was in the reserves, but still. Yeah, yeah, right. I could but see him talking. Impressive. I could see him talking shit to John Wayne. <laughs> you play yeah, a soldier. Hopefully, a soldier. so you know. I mean, you know, Hollywood churned out propaganda during sure. wartime, and John Wayne was there leading the charge in yeah. um, the Longest Day and movies like that. And okay, yeah, that served its purpose, but John Wayne never had a bullet whiz past his head in real life where Jimmy Stewart's out there dropping bombs on the Nazis. That's was, pretty impressive. Was was Wayne at the age where he did not have to serve? Like, maybe he was too old for World War II. I'm not sure World what II, maybe reason. Maybe too young for World War One. I, I. That's a good I, question. I can't remember <laughs> when he was born. And, no, I, yeah. think, I think he could. I think you were eligible to serve. I think they, they went all the way up to, like, 41, I think. Yeah. 41 or 42, so. Yeah, and he was in his prime during that time, so yeah. okay. I'll have to look up. I don't want to, I don't want bad mouth or anything, but I'll yeah, have to look yeah. up why he didn't serve, but. Sure, sure. But, yeah, you you want to you want to look for a hero, Jimmy Stewart, uh, you know, put up, man. He put. Yeah. Money where his mouth is. That's you know, and, and yeah. you're talking about you mentioned uh, Douglas, uh, Mr. Rogers enlisted hmm. for the draft in 1948, but I could not medically was not medically allowed to go. Now when he you got the hmm. physical exam. Now you say that I remember hearing about that, but I don't remember what the yeah, but Mr. Rogers the ailment was. But uh, now didn't Mr. Rogers? Get the super serum and turned into Captain America. Oh, that's a different Mr. Oh, Rogers. That's Steve Rogers. That was yeah. his brother, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you. St I mean, Steve and, and Mr. Rogers. And he, that neighborhood was rough. <laughs> that was a rough neighborhood, man. I'm telling you, we did not script this. That, just hap that magic just happens on the air. It happens. Yeah. All right, so that kind of covers my contribution uh, for now. Uh, imagine those Pete. Uh, you were going to talk a little bit about the directors who uh, went to serve their country during this time, contributing yeah. their skills. And actually, one of the things that I would recommend to our audience and anyone listening out there, they talk about the five, uh, the five that came back. It's uh, came out on Netflix, and it highlights a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about because it, it focused when the war started, and 
they were saying, okay, how do we get a bunch of people? How do we get a bunch of kids from Kansas and Oklahoma and Nebraska to sign up and go fight a war that for the most time was up until very recently, there was a huge isolationist pull. Yes. Yeah, it's fact, not our war sort of a thing. In yeah. fact, I uh, forgot. Uh, up until pretty much Pearl, Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor. Yeah. In fact, I, I remember there was a senator, I think Niles is the last name, staunch uh, anti-war, staunch isolationist, I should say, not anti-war. And when Hollywood would ever make any movie that came relatively close to talking about what was going on in Europe and maybe, hey, should we get involved in this stuff? Said, you know what? Hollywood is trying to prop uh, is using propaganda. We're having a Senate subcommittee to find out what's going on here. And let's investigate this. Oh. So they were right up there because they didn't want to give any credence to because Roosevelt was thinking because Churchill was like, are you coming or not? Yeah, yeah. Because oh, oh, we are no. getting pounded right now and we need some help so are you in or are you not frank and yeah. it's getting kind of ridiculous now i'm paraphrasing apparently Re- yeah. <laughs> uh i don't remember how many times uh but the 12 months leading up to pearl harbor roosevelt went in front of congress i think three or four times yeah. asking for a declaration mm. because he saw what was happening he saw what was happening in east asia and there were elements within and- the senate that said if you do this, we are going to start thinking of the I word for you because you're impeachment. Yeah, because yeah. you're mm-hmm. bordering on like, wh- why are you yeah. trying to do this? You know, it's so fascinating to think about. I just read recently there's a video game that either has been released or will be released soon, and it takes the approach of what would have happened had America stayed neutral. Let's say the Axis powers won World War II, and in this video game, the U.S. is defending their West Coast against the Japan and their East Coast against the Nazis, and now the war is coming to our land. And so that's what's so, I don't know, mind-boggling that these people were opposed to war because had they sat this one out, we were going to get in it at some point. And, at at, at and, some point. And we may have been overwhelmed if if we didn't get in when we did. You, so. you, you, you've heard of the... Uh, the I believe Amazon show uh, Man in the High Castle. Yeah. I've heard of it. I've never so, seen it. Yeah. Talks so, about this. So that's if that really happened. That's the premise. Yeah. Yeah. And in the middle of the country is is sort of like the rebels fighting you, off. You know, yeah, the invaders from um, the east and west. Yeah. But you talk about uh, something up my alley is uh, alternative history. Hmm. Uh, yeah. What if that happened? Uh, what if uh, our founding fathers lost the Revolutionary War? Mm-hmm. You know. I mean, oh, sure. Now, what, what did, <laughs> did one of you guys tell me about some sort of proposed alliance with Mexico where they were yes. encouraged to attack us from the south? Yeah. And Mexico's yeah. like, nah, the, we're good. There was, there was a, me- I forgot the name of the memo, but it was a German me- <laughs> Mexican telegram saying, hey, you know, we, 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 we can send a couple hundred thousand Germans and invade and they never would have made it. The but, U.S. But they, well, were, they were trying to use never, Mexico. Never say never. Well, well here's the thing they're Mex- the not for the Nazis, they're Mexicans. So this is basically cannon fodder. You, you poke the bear, they'll mm-hmm. slaughter you, but they'll be weakened and distracted long enough for us to come and, you know, yeah, because you know, there it, it's the same thing with the, with the Japanese. Hitler was never going to honor that pact because yeah. oh once, yeah, they, he turned on everybody. Yeah, once, so, yeah. once oh yeah, if yeah. Hit, if Hitler had taken uh, Stalingrad and, and taken the Middle Eastern oil fields, yeah, yeah, then Japan was next. Yeah, yeah, they would use Japan to weaken Russia from the from. Yeah. The other side, I think that's the big thing, Joe. If, if once Russia falls, then you, we're truly alone in that, in that yeah, war. Yeah. 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 Yep. Um, so you had told me before the podcast that there were a number of directors yeah. who uh, created propaganda to help the war effort. So there, there was a uh, uh, John Ford was one of the first ones, and he was invited to the Pentagon to create something called Field Photo. And this was meant to be America's way of marshalling the, the nation. To, hey, we need to get involved. This is who we're going to be up again. We need to get rally, mobilized. Rally around the flag. And yep. because kids at the time, the War Department had tried lectures, people going around lecturing, giving books, giving radio programs. They're not listening. For some reason, film was uniquely at the time captive because it was film. Everyone wanted to go to the movies. Everyone mm-hmm. loved seeing stuff on the big screen. It was so an escape, yeah. That's how you get the 18 to 24-year-olds, 18 to 30-year-olds. That's how you're going to get that generation. And so they recruited Hollywood to come and do it. And it, uh, Frank Capra at the time was brought in to George Marshall 
General Marshall, and they said, okay, I'm going to show you a Nazi propaganda film, and you tell me, you know, this is what we're up against. And he's, Capra sees it, and he goes, we're going to lose. Because it was so well done. He goes, that's yeah. why, that's how, that's why, they're almost lockstep. They almost treat yeah. Hitler like a god. This is, our guy, how, how's an 18-year-old from, Can, you know, from, you know, Kansas supposed to go up against that, you know, seeing this? Yeah, yeah that's something we were talking about earlier, is that the Nazis were using film tricks and techniques yes. to portray their enemy as monsters to uh, rile up their their fan base and, and have them support the cause. And it was all Hollywood magic that was doing it. So the U.S. had to step up and compete with that. <laughs> and they said, we need to copy what they're doing. Now. And they yeah. did. We need to learn how to demonize. And, uh, yeah. and you saw all those uh, rate. The Japanese, the, Japanese, yeah, the, the yeah. racist. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, oh, sure. And that, so, that actually came into play. And, uh, yeah. Uh, it's... John Millett, I think he was one of the people in, involved in the in Hollywood who was saying, hey, you know, we got to kind of tone down this. What's going on? Because anytime we show Germans, it was the German people were okay. It was Hitler was the bad guy, not yeah. the, the German people. But anything to do with the Japanese, it was every yeah. <laughs> every racist trope you could hit, they yeah. hit it. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think going as far as calling them monkeys and oh. saying that they were uh, like ants and they live in colonies and, you know, anything you could do to dehumanize them, they would do that. And they're doing that while there were American Japanese yeah. here in the um, Americas who were getting uh, rounded up and put into yeah. camps like George Takai and his family. Yeah. And that was yeah, so, the Japanese internment camps, one of FDR's. Unfortunately, that's, you know, we that, talk about a blemish on, on his record yeah. that, that he can't escape. I, I believe uh, I believe the number was uh, 140,000 yeah. mm. Japanese Americans put into camps. Wow. Yep. Who, who I'm sure all would have been willing to fight and die for this country, right. yet they were being uh, dehumanized and put into camps. But it never it went the tragic. other way. They never arrested anyone of German descent. No, yeah. no, no, no. Or Italian descent. That's very You know, Joe DiMaggio was just fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Joe, yeah. what's going on? I was like, hey, isn't there Mussolini? What's, mm. what's going on over there? But, man. Uh, but, but it seemed like what Hollywood yeah. was, would do with uh, Hitler is try to make him look like a buffoon. Like Charlie Chaplin. Who was one of the first? Yes. Chaplin and the Stooges. Yep. Like, yes, the yes. three Stooges were one of the first times that that was even addressed on film. And here's Mo mocking... Hitler hilariously and making him look like a buffoon, and that probably made Hitler more angry than anything else. Now, uh, I believe all three of the original uh, Stooges were were Jewish Americans. Yes. Yep, so yep. I wonder if they had, because uh, th there are questions about how much the average American knew about what was going on. Yeah, but I wonder if they somehow knew. Oh, sure. Didn't want to publicly say the you know there are Jews being exterminated, but this was their subversive way of saying, oh, sure, this guy is pure yeah. evil. We need to get the word out, even if it's through our comedy. Yep. That somebody needs to do something about this. Yeah, yeah. It's like, what can I do with the tools I have at my disposal? Well, let's laugh at them. Let's make fun yeah. of them. And then people will be like, "Oh, so that's what's going on over there." So you, yeah, you, you try to get that that the undercurrent of truth through comedy, right, to make people think and, yeah. and question. Oh crap, something is going on. The five directors that uh, really kind of led the way on this were John Ford, being one. He actually filmed the Battle of Midway, mm. and that was one of the first big films that came on there. Okay. And in that Netflix uh, series that I'm talking about, that has played a huge role because he goes to Midway and he. He infamously stands on the platform. They're like, uh, Mr. Ford, I don't know if that's where you want to stand in an air raid battle, in, in a battle, because you're, you're what's for dinner. You're what's for dinner when, when, the, when the Japanese come by. So he, he stayed there. He filmed everything. And one of the key things that saved and that helped launch the, uh, the entire uh, effort was he happened to catch footage of uh, I, uh, pre um, President um, Roosevelt's son who was serving at the time who was at the Battle of Midway. Mm. Oh, wow. Midway Island. And he kept a little piece of the film. Off. He didn't want to put... He he some, he some did some amazing way to get that footage all the way to his editor in, in California and said, mm. go to California. Don't go don't go to D.C. Don't go to the barracks. Go to your mom's place. Edit it for me. Don't let the War Department... They'll catch up eventually, but we need to edit this film the way we need to before mm. they get their hands on it. Really? Wow. And he gets it all the way up to a screening for President Roosevelt. And at the last second, he takes that clip of his son and says, "Okay, slice, splice that in there right now." And mm. so, in the in the in the Netflix series, you see, you know, 
President Roosevelt was excited. He's like, oh, that's a B-17. That's a And then his son comes up. Wow. And everyone goes dead silent. How powerful. And then yeah. Eisenhower, at, I mean, Heiser, uh, Roosevelt says at the end, I want this shown everywhere across the country. <laughs> of course. What's the name of the Netflix series? Uh, five. Five, five Came Back. Okay. The five that came back, yeah. Okay, because that sounds very. Yeah, it follows uh, George uh, George Stevens, uh, William Wyler, uh, John Houston, John Ford, and uh, Frank Capra. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah, five great names in yes. film history. Yeah. And what they were basically going up against, and sometimes they had to recreate scenes, and when they ha- were recreating scenes because they'd already missed the battle because they didn't have the resources, and they were going, "Well, this doesn't land." It's almost like a film, like when they would play it between the newsreels, it wouldn't land, and they're going, oh, this is not good. And then for North Africa, when the British were fighting, the British had their act together. It's, it felt like everybody else had their act together except the Americans <laughs> when it came to making war propaganda. At the okay, time. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. And so, you know, kind of a hidden uh, war propaganda, of course, were just mainstream Hollywood release releases that would – wave the flag and try to rile up moviegoers. And I think that's a good segue into our yeah. next segment is is movies, uh, war movies that in some cases, you know, glamorized war and, and tried to fire up Americans. And then there are Hollywood films that looked at war for what it really is. Uh, yeah. You know, whenever I, I, I badmouth war, I don't want that to be perceived as me knocking our our troops i mean i admire anybody who can put their lives on the line and go fight for our country whether they were drafted or volunteered or whatever um but i hate war and it's amazing to think that uh we have not been at war for what two years now or something like it was like our first christmas a year or so ago where we weren't at in an active conflict so i hate war war, yeah 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 um the last official war was world war ii yeah and since then you know yeah 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 but anyway no but yeah so so now it's time and we got what about about almost 15 minutes left um to talk about how hollywood depicted war in film now obviously during world war ii um, you know, they, there's John Wayne and there were people who were going out, uh, fighting on film to try and, and rile up the masses to support the war effort. But then, uh, almost immediately they started dealing with the horrors of war. Uh, there was a movie that came out, um, the best years of our lives. You remember mm, this? I've, I've heard the, of I it, but I think it was an Oscar winning film and there's an actor in it and I'm going to do him a disservice. Like don't come up with his name real quick. But he fought in the war. He lost both hands. Hmm. He uh, had hooks on his hands. And he starred in this movie about soldiers returning home from war and not being treated properly or respectfully and being looked at like, you know, you see these hooks and it's like, oh, no, he's, he's a monster or whatever. So fairly early on, there were brave filmmakers who wanted to depict the cost the, the of reality war. Of war. Yeah, the what, cost of war. Approximately what year are we talking? Uh, let me film? bring this up. Best years of our lives, 1946. So this is Whoa. this is pretty early on when, yeah. when the, maybe the first soldier started. I would say returning home. That's a that's a that's a pretty brave dude. Yeah, yeah. So uh, let's see. It stars Myrna Loy, Dana Andrews, Frederick March. Let me find the actor. Uh, Harold Russell is the actor who uh, starred in the movie and had actual hooks for hands. And I believe he won an Academy Award. Let me scroll here. So he was an Oscar winner uh, for Best Actor in a Supporting Role uh, for Best Years of Our Lives. So Good for him. So, yeah, so like I said, fairly early on, there were movies uh, that were taking that controversial step of depicting the, the horrors of war. Um, of course... You know, in the 60s and 70s, there's an uh, outright rebellion, anti-war effort, rightfully so, you know, when Vietnam is, is raging on. Um, so, Andrew, what, what movies did you see that sort of spoke out against war that really hit you hard? Oh, man, where do we start? <laughs> and and for, for the record, these weren't the first time that you were watching them. So this, these were things that you'd already seen. The, these, yeah, these are all movies I've seen. Okay, so we don't get to count these as, as on your to-do list. No, no. These right. the, these are these are well ingrained. Uh, all right then. So, some of my you know, you know, top one hundred movies. Um, 
if uh, to start off going in chronological order, uh, I believe 1964, and it's not your traditional war movie, but uh, Kubrick's um, Doctor Strangelove. Yeah. Oh my God! Because yeah, what a brilliant satire and commentary. Uh, oh my God! Yeah. I, I I'm almost embarrassed to say this. I only saw this for the first time about a year ago, hey. and it blew me away and i was mad at myself that i hadn't seen it earlier hey i was familiar with moments you know slim yeah. pickens riding the bomb that's yeah. fairly yeah. iconic but when you sit down and watch that movie you're like holy it, cow it's 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 kubrick being very funny in a very dark way yeah he is telling the truth about the absurdity of war and yeah. how close during world war ii and the Cold War after, how close yeah. we could come, and even so, today in 2023, global to annihilation, complete annihilation of the planet, uh, killing everybody. Yeah. Um, Remember, this is not too long ago after the Cuban Missile Crisis, when that's exactly was the this. News. Yeah, this yeah. this came so, out w- one or two years after. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And fear was running rampant at the time. Right. Yeah. And Kubrick, with he he was a. A genius, and he knew exactly what he was, what he was doing. But anyway, uh, I, I don't want to spend. Sellers, yeah, yeah, yeah Peter, Peter, playing a couple different parts. <laughs> he was uh, supposed to play another role, but the, he had gotten he, he injured got, or something, yeah. so they had to recast the, his what fourth role. <laughs> I, I, I I thought I thought he they actually filmed it and they cut it, but I no no run. no he was injured. He was doing a stunt or something. He got hurt, and so they said, okay, you can't play all the roles, so they recast it. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I. I I have a couple movies, so I, I don't want to spend too much time, but some sure. honorable mentions. Fast forward to, I believe, 77 or 78, where you had both Deer Hunter and Apocalypse Now. Yeah. yeah. Have, have you guys seen both of those? Yeah, and I was probably too young to see them, and uh, they yeah. they will mess you up. Like, yeah. yeah. Pay attention yeah. to those movie ratings for those for any youngins out there, especially now, kids. Yeah. <laughs> Deer yeah. Hunter uh, is, is where... The, the war the war came home yeah yeah and made you um, realize what was going on in the pow camps and yeah. stuff like that yeah. um and then uh the last two nights uh, I, bro- I broke up uh and watched uh first half and second half of platoon hmm. now quickly i just wanted to say uh some similarities between apocalypse now and platoon martin sheen uh starred in apocalypse now his son charlie who was very young at the time, yeah. starred in Platoon, which came out only I, eight years after Apocalypse mm-hmm. Now. Uh, both films uh, include the main characters doing uh, voiceovers, mm. which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, and I was wondering if Oliver Stone with Platoon uh, intentionally did that as an homage to Hopeful. the yeah. Apocalypse Uh mm-hmm. And that that movie in and of itself, it just it shows the torment and the uh, the th- these young men uh, six thousand miles away from home asking, "What the heck are we doing here?" Oh, sure, yeah. What is this? And then the confusion of war when things don't go right. If one person in your unit falls asleep during uh, when they're supposed to be on patrol. Um, Couple year, couple years later, born on the Fourth of July with Tom Cruise. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's kind the of war similar to Best Years of Our Lives, yeah. where he comes home yeah. and he's and, wheelchair bound. Yeah, yeah. And people yeah. Are, are wondering, you know, are giving him grief. It's, a lot of the Vietnam veterans got unfairly spit know, on and yeah. booed, and yes. yeah, and it, these weren't the guys that were. And causing and this most of them got drafted like, too. You know, it's not like they all exactly. just get, you know, yeah, yeah. Popping and skipping there. You, you, you don't don't be don't be spitting on these guys. Spit on the, the senate politicians. Yeah. yeah, the the people who, you know, yeah. Oh, and you think and, about like the Pentagon Papers, people who knew that this was a failed exercise, but they just kept funneling, kept going. Yeah, yeah, and it, fighting on their terms, on yeah. their turf. And jungles that they knew the ins and outs of, and our boys were just overwhelmed over there. Yeah. Um, uh, just a few more. Uh, I I don't I don't know if it's it's probably in uh, top five or top ten of my favorite war movies, but it's not my favorite war movie. But the the star power, the action scenes, and the the 
the breadth of the movie, uh, of course, Saving Private Ryan. Oh, yeah. sure. But also, Spielberg does hammer home how futile uh, th- their trek was because yeah, yeah. everyone ended up dying except for the guy they were trying to save. I mean, they, yeah. they saved Private Ryan. They did their job. Right, yeah. right. But at what cost? Yeah. You know? Yeah, um, and I, you know, I've heard stories that veterans who were in that audience to see that film had to get up and walk out, not because they were angry or thought the movie was bad, is because it was causing them to relive yeah. the experience of storming Normandy in, in those beaches because it was so accurate. Yeah. And, and I remember sitting in the theater with Dolby surround sound yeah, me too. ducking. Like, I would hear bullets, like, <laughs> zing, zing. it's like, oh, my God. So that came it out was very visceral. That came out in, I believe, 98 or 99? Uh, 1997. Mm. So I, I would have been too young to see it. It's so 98, yeah. Well. So, but I, I distinctly remember the network premiere mm. of that came out on TV probably two years later, and it was on ABC on Channel 7, and they made an exception – Show, to, to, show to, to to show yeah. with a disclaimer with yeah. a disclaimer to show mm-hmm. the violence and uh, the the language yeah. you know the, as is, it, yeah. it's rated R in every way except for the but the, I would tell sex. you I, I would say this if you ever get an opportunity to see it in theater you should see it it's it's yeah, yeah if if they yeah. bring it back for a third twenty five or thirty year anniversary in the future I that opening I'd probably see it that opening fifteen minutes is probably, oh my god that's where people are just like oh my god and you and you see you see what goes on in there and just the he captured everything. They went through a boot camp yeah. for that thing. It's yeah, it's right up there. Yeah, yeah. Um, IMDb says nineteen ninety eight. There yes. you go. And um, you know, if you watch war movies, one of my all time favorite movies was um, uh, dang it, why am I drawing a blank? It was it was uh, it was a World War Two movie that leads up to the events of storming Normandy Beach. And if you watch that movie back to back with Saving Private Ryan, it's almost like a prequel and a sequel. Uh, it'll pop into my head when I'm not thinking about mm, it, but interesting. Um, but yeah, seeing those horrors depicted on uh, at at the storming of Normandy Beach, uh, man, it's just insane, insane. What one, one more I'll mention uh, also because it's it's a great movie. Um, what by one of my current favorite directors. It doesn't have a whole lot of action, uh, but Dunkirk by Chris Nolan. Yeah, yeah, that and, one was, and and ripping. how he he plays with time. And, yeah. um, you know, the three different stories going on taking place during three different time periods. And at the end, they all come to, they all or, or, tie or three, together. Or three different phases of the evacuation. Of yes, yes, yeah. yes. Uh, and in my opinion, and I don't know, uh, Chris Nolan is the closest thing to our generation's Kubrick in terms yeah. of brilliance, in terms of mapping out exactly what he wants to put through. I will uh, say to this. The audience. Well, you know, I, I'm a big fan of Chris Nolan. I still don't understand Tenet. <laughs> Tenet is. One I of, haven't seen that. It's, one. It's, I, it's, I, it's one of his lesser movies. I'm a big sci fi fan. I like the concept of going, you know, the time moving backwards and all that. I'm like, I would look at that and went, come on, Chris. Come on, man. But the, uh, the movie I was yeah. trying to think of was called The Longest Day. Yeah. Amazing star studded cast, I, similar to Saving that's Private. That's a three and a half hour movie uncut. Yeah. But it, that's one well, that, you know, when, when Memorial Day rolls around, Veterans yeah. Day rolls around, that's one you might want to pop in and watch. Now, you know, as great as these movies are, they're like Saving Private Ryan, that's not something I can sit and watch over and over and over because it messes yeah. with me. I, I remember oh, shaking yeah. in the theater like, this is a little too real. Yeah, so. you, yeah you see uh, guys ripped in half, uh, limbs. And, I mean, and, uh, and it's, it's just the way, and, and, and also it's the way you lose those characters. It's Vin Diesel's character. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. Oppum, the way he goes. Oh, that was, yeah, brutal. And, and yeah. Tom Hanks's character. Yeah. Very emotional. Yeah. It, uh, Spielberg knows how to bring out emotion in all of his films. Mm-hmm. All right, on that note, uh, God, I feel like we go another half hour just talking about yes, war movies. Yes, sure. Um, but, no, good, good one, guys. And, uh, again, we want to honor uh those who fought and yes. died and served our country yep. and uh thank you and thank our listeners and yes. guys thank you for another great episode of hollywood crime scene it was great yeah thank you gentlemen